around finding stuff on your reading list and doing things with it. Um, it's the first step in a modular research skills division which I run, which is open to absolutely everybody in Cambridge University, all cohorts, all subjects, all levels. So what I key my sessions around is really phases of the study and research process. I don't have the luxury of tying them in with degree level or cohort level um, students at all. So I have to address specific phases and let the students self-identify. Yeah, I'm having a poxy time with my reading list, so I'll go to this session, it might help. So the target audience is any student who's in the directed learning phase, where they're being given input from the supervisor or from course director, being given lists of stuff, this is good, you should read this. Or it's also quite useful for newcomers to the Cambridge Library System, because we've got over 100 libraries in Cambridge University, and in one of them, which is the one that I work in, we've got 8 million things. 5 million of them are on the catalogue. Right? So it's kind of useful to have a little bit of grounding in how to find your stuff. So although I hate your word find, and I try to move away from it, it's got to be a kind of my starting point, and then we go beyond. So this particular session is good for those who are doing essay writing as opposed to discovery type research, extended research. So people who are being asked to work from recommended items which have been pre-selected. So it's good for tracking down known items as opposed to discovering the good old unknown unknowns. So in 2011, when it was still called How to Find Things on Your Reading List, these were the four aims of the session. Discover how to decipher your reading list, find incomplete references, find out where to search for what. It's bolded because that's what took up 90% of the session. This is a sort of awful guided tour around all the poxy interfaces that we have for you, for you you can find stuff and everyone comes out feeling really depressed. True, part of it is about if you go to the right kind of place and you know enough to go to the right kind of place, you save time and energy. But it's not a great sales pitch, let's face it. I also had a wonderful time trying to explain to people the relationship between our two key finding aids, which is the catalog library search. Now our version of Summon is called Library Search Plus, just to confuse the hell out of everybody. Library Search is at the browser, that's our catalog. Within it you've got our other main finding apparatus of the time in 2011, our A to Z list of journal titles. Have you ever known a student look for a journal title? No, me neither. And as you can see, just trying to describe the relationship between the catalogue and the A to Z list of journals is kind of beyond my graphical ability, really. <laughs> 2012, with how to decode your reading list, the learning outcomes are significantly different. Now what we're talking about is understanding the reading list as a tool. What is this thing that I've been given? In Cambridge, it could range from one page in alphabetical order through to 100 pages. History first years get a 100 page reading list. It's slightly faceted, so it goes by subject, it goes by theme, but within the facets, it's alphabetical. So what is this tool? What am I going to do with it? Where do I go with it? Where do I start? Do I start, do I start at the top and read my way down? How would you know not to do that unless somebody tells you how this works? How will you know how to critically evaluate this thing that your, your God Almighty High Supervisor that you worship has given you? Of course you have to read everything on it, don't you, to be a good student? How would you know that you are allowed to exercise critical evaluation on this tool until somebody comes and says, this is about you and your choice and your learning? So we've still got understanding various material formats and there is an aim as well, but as I'll show you in a minute, we'll take a slightly different approach to that from 2012 onwards. And there still has to be a little bit about being able to get at incomplete references because academics hate doing referencing. So sometimes they give really poxy references. Yeah. Oh, here's a great article. I can't actually remember what journal it's in or anything. Thankfully, that doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> so, pre summer I have the most depressing handout in the world. Where to search for what? To find a book or a book chapter, you have to go here to find a reference that looks like this. That's a journal, so you have to go somewhere else. God. <laughs> 2012. Forget about the, I have to go here for this and here for that. Now we can start talking about what these things are. Eleanor was saying about the journal. Was it Eleanor? No. Whoever it was was saying, yes. What is a journal? Well, it's the thing you write in, like a diary. Yeah, okay, in one context. When you're talking about it in the academic context, it's something else. See that entry at the bottom? And that's what it is, and that's what it does, and that's where it might come in useful for what you're doing right now. What's your essay title? What's your field? What scope? 
is the thing that you're working on the task at hand? Oh, do you know, maybe it might be worth looking into a monograph as opposed to a textbook. So this is all about formats in terms of what they might be good for for study and research and learning as opposed to formats as in where you have to find what. Um, all my handouts, well no, not the old poxy ones, but these handouts, they're on the web. I license all my stuff under Creative Commons. If this looks at all useful, knock yourself out. Take it, do stuff with it, change it, amend it, whatever you like. What I love about what I can do now is that by getting away from the find it here mentality, I can talk about not just decoding and reading this, but decoding the expectations in academia. A journal means something different in academia. Once you know that, you're good to go. Once you know the minutiae, the oddnesses, the weird things that we do and say within the academic language, the weird ways we behave, why do I have to put this reference in here? You know, I wouldn't normally do that. You start to become part of a community of practice that can otherwise be incredibly exclusionist. A lot of its members don't realize how exclusionist it can be. But once you start looking at things like, what's a journal? Well, it's a diary. Then you start thinking, hey, we've got a hell of a long way to go to opening those barriers and working with students and what they bring as opposed to going, oh, yeah, just go and use a journal. No explanation of what. So this is the first step to decoding academic conventions, scholarly expectations that I am quite often not articulated anywhere else. Well, pre summon 2011. This is an actual slide, and my notes for it read like this. Locating literary language is the title of a chapter within a book. There are two reasons why it's important for you to know about this. So you don't waste time reading the whole thing when your supervisor just wants you to read a chapter. So you look at the right part of the citation on the library catalog, because you've got to search by the book title, not by the chapter. Anyone still awake? 2012 onwards. I can stop this crap about you have to look in different places for the things you want, depending on what the citation says. And I can start saying things like, now that you've got stuff, how are you going to use it? What's it going to do for you? When you start evaluating it, think about your question. Your question should take you forward in a nice, straight pathway to your destination. This comes from my supervisor in Northumbria, Alison Picard, this idea of the white rabbit. You're going along your path towards your research question really nicely, and then a brilliant piece of writing kind of comes across your horizon like this. It's not actually really on your topic, but you kind of go, oh, that's lovely. Oh, oh, wow. Awesome. Yay. And then pull down a rabbit hole. So this is part of your critically evaluating. What exactly is this being critical stuff? The key to it is to return to your question. How does that result serve your question? What will it do for you? How far can you lean on it? Keeping your critical distance, not getting sucked in. So we can now start talking, not about find, but about use. The implications that this has for learner agency are really the thing that gets me most excited. I'm, I'm a huge fan of telling our students about the sort of stuff I've been saying, about decoding what academics want and don't tell you, about helping them become part of a, a community of practice which is about behaving a certain way, writing in a certain way, and acting an identity. Growing into your identity as an undergraduate student is one of the hardest things there is. What if you have done Eleanor's Step Up to H E course? What if you're a parent? What if you're a professional? What if you're coming from industry? What if you have an identity established already where you are not looking for answers all the time, but where you have to give people answers? How do you measure? How do you match up those two identities? How do you go about being a student? So I think that this attitude, I'm not going to say this, this session or this course, but this attitude underlying the way we talk to our students about information and how we use it can really help us to help them start situating themselves within the boundaries of academia as opposed to outside of. That's all I wanted to say about my class. I will say that in the afternoon I'm going to be doing one of the breakout sessions and um, well I thought I'd like pull you in like little fishes by saying I'm going to show you a diagram that looks like a pizza. There you go, it's a diagram that looks like a pizza. What I really want to look at and explore is this idea of moving away from key skills and moving up outwards through these levels of learning. So you get the key skills, you can use your keyboard, your, your keyboard you can access interfaces. That's key skills level. And then the, what you do with it, how do you fit it into your subject context? 
how are you going to manipulate the information, both in terms of saving and storing it, either in future proofing it, but then using it in your work, sharing as well as storing? And how are you going to manage the reflective or the relational side of this whole experience as you learn to perform this new identity? How are you going to manage your learning to learn? So what I want to look at in my breakout sessions this afternoon is this moving from key skills to the higher order information usages. So not just the opportunities that are afforded us by interfaces, but also shifting our own thinking and our own teaching towards the same. I'm done. Thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go horrendously fast. I don't get to teach lawyers at all because they have an embedded information literacy course that is, um, it's a really excellent model I think because it is truly embedded and not just integrated. It keeps pace with their training um, in all the other areas around becoming a lawyer. It keeps pace with them at every single step all the way through. So I do teach all subjects apart from all. <laughs> So the question was, does the research skills course appear on the student's higher education achievement record? Is that uh, an external thing or do you mean that the record held within the university? Yes, it does now. It does because a couple of years back I got really pissed off with having to manage all these courses manually and moved it onto a centralized booking system which does all that for me, which is awesome. And sometimes I get students who still come under the transferable skills, um, the ex Roberts money scheme. So that's, this is how a lot of engineers and scientists make their way into my, my sessions because they actually find it as a transfer, they get transferable skills credit. So although you said it's not part of an accrediting course, they, they still get something that will help them in terms of that project? Um, it's a yes. In a manner of speaking, yes. But I think the way that we frame employability or don't frame employability is, is odd at Cambridge because I think they're still feeling that if you go to Cambridge, you will just get employment. We don't have to identify employability attributes. Uh, we don't need to go into the gradu graduate attributes route. We don't have much tie-in between, for, ex for instance, careers and training and information literacy teaching. So th there's no real alignment between those things. So yeah, the stuff is on their records, but whether they think of using it in support of being more employable is probably doubtful. <laughs> Thank you. Do you mind if I repeat it? <laughs> so it was a really, it was a compliment. So hey, so it's just to say that very nice to have Eleanor's and my presentations side by side to see how we're dealing with students going into the academic arena in a pre-sessional way and then dealing with the challenges of being at an elite, elite university once they get there. Yeah, but thank I'm you. Participation in the <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that for the <laughs> It's already on SlideShare, my presentation. It's on SlideShare. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Under librarian goddess, aspirational. <laughs> it's from what I just like sure everything kind of on the blog afterwards as well? And everything will go on the Summon IL blog afterwards as well, all the presentations. <laughs>